everyone is doing well. Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us today. I'm Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott, Director of Department of Health, and Dr. Phil Chan is here, our Rhode Island Department of Health Consultant Medical Director and lead in terms of our vaccine uh, response with uh, reporting out what's been going on. And we are also joined by Director Brett Smiley from the Rhode Island Department of Administration. Like we usually do, I'll start by giving an overview of our numbers and a few general updates. As you can see on our dashboard, and as Dr. Chan will explain in more detail, 63,152 doses of COVID-19 vaccine have been administered in Rhode Island to date, and 12,515 people have been fully immunized, first and second doses. As I've outlined before, ordering, receiving, distributing and redistributing, storing and administering vaccine is a very complex process. But the systems we have in place here in Rhode Island are strong and they are working well. We are only getting very limited amounts of vaccine right now, like all other states, but we continue to be in the top tier nationally in terms of doses administered per capita. We have a huge team of folks across the state who are engaged and ready once we get additional vaccine to really be able to accelerate what we need to in getting as much of our population vaccinated as possible. So thank you to all of the inv individuals that are involved. We are administering the doses that we have in a way that will have the greatest impact on the health of our state and with a deliberate focus on equity. Equity, fairness, and transparency have been priorities for us throughout, and they will remain priorities going forward. It's our role to continue to share the basis for that, what we are thinking, and help you understand what's needed to keep everyone as safe as possible. Dr. Chan is going to provide some more detailed updates on where we stand in our vaccination campaign, but I wanted to share that we have started to send out a weekly COVID-19 vaccine update. If you want to get the latest on our vaccination campaign, you can go to c19vaccineri.org to sign up. In terms of our case data, we had 698 new cases yesterday of 20,079 tests. That's a percent positivity for yesterday of 3.5%. And our weekly percent positive is 5%. So right at the threshold that we have set. That 3.5% positive number is great news. Not so great news. Sadly, we have 18 new fatalities to report, which brings our total for COVID-19 associated fatalities to 2,076. Of these new COVID-19 fatalities, Two of the individuals were in their 50s, two were in their 60s, four people were in their 70s, seven individuals were in their 80s, and three were in their 90s. Our condolences and our hearts go out to the families of these precious Rhode Islanders who we have lost. While I always report our fatality data with an extremely heavy heart, our case data is a little more promising. After we saw a peak in early December, our percent positivity and hospitalization numbers have all generally been decreasing slowly and steadily. The last time that our weekly percent positive was at that 5% mark was all the way back in the first week of November. If you recall, right before we started our pause at the start of December, 
our percent positive was almost double what it is now, close to 10%. These trends and the fact that more and more vaccine is slowly but steadily getting administered every day in Rhode Island, our uh, signs are all going in the right direction. However, COVID-19 is not going away tomorrow. As much as we would like it to, it is not. We do have the tools to be able to handle it. We are all going to need to continue taking measures to prevent the spread of this virus even after we have been vaccinated. COVID-19 vaccine is extremely effective at protecting you from developing symptoms of COVID-19. For our most at-risk populations, this means, and this is our key, that it will be extremely effective at preventing people from being hospitalized and from passing away from COVID-19. This is great. This is what our focus is. We want to prevent hospitalizations and we want to keep people alive. This also allows us to protect our healthcare system capacity, which we need to be able to ensure is in place. Obviously, every one of us wants to prevent any more loss of life. And as a second key consideration, keeping hospitalizations low is critical to our ability to managing this pandemic. At the same time, an outstanding question is whether the vaccine will prevent infection completely and prevent you from spreading it to another person, even if you yourself don't actually experience any symptoms of COVID-19. Now that's a complicated concept to understand regarding the vaccine. So I want to really talk about this further. While the vaccine will prevent most people from getting very sick from COVID-19 and ultimately from going to the hospital or from dying, we still don't know for certain that it will totally prevent you from actually getting the virus or from spreading coronavirus. Because you could still get COVID-19 even after you've had the vaccine, not have any symptoms, but you could still get it and potentially spread it to others, you need to continue to wear your mask, watch your distance around anyone you don't live with, wash your hands regularly, and continue to be vigilant in the ways that we've talked about, even after you get vaccinated. Another key component with that is as of right now, nothing changes with quarantine and isolation. If you've been vaccinated and test positive for COVID-19, you must still isolate. If you've been vaccinated and are a close contact of someone who tested positive or have recently traveled to another state with a high positivity rate, you must still quarantine. If you have symptoms of COVID-19, you should isolate at home, call your healthcare provider, and get tested for COVID-19, whether or not you have received the vaccine. Testing is more available now than it ever has been in Rhode Island. If you go online right now to portal.ri.gov, you can make a same-day appointment to get tested at many sites throughout the state. It's a, a real tribute to how hard the team has been working across the board and really the, the effective improvements that have been made time and time again. And it explains why Rhode Island is leading in terms of testing in our COVID response. We have a few new testing sites continuing to open on a regular basis, including this week. For example, just today, two new sites are opening. One is at the Knights of Columbus Hall on Valley Road in Middletown. This site will be open seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and can handle 500 appointments a day to get tested. 
In Woonsocket, a testing site is also opening today at Thundermist on Clinton Street. A K-12 testing site is already operating there, but there is space for general public testing now two, um, seven days a week from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. This site also has capacity for an additional 500 tests a day. For both sites and for the 14 other sites throughout the state, you make an appointment at portal.ri.gov. It's fast, it's easy, and it's free. I'm continuing to get tested regularly, and I urge all Rhode Islanders to think about regularly getting tested for COVID-19. This is especially important with the newer strain of COVID-19 identified in our neighboring states. Although we are doing a systematic process to identify it via our state health laboratory here in Rhode Island and have not seen it as of yet, we know that because of its presence in our region, in our neighboring states, it is a matter of time. Being able to use the tools that we have prepared for you, getting tested regularly, accessing the treatment, wearing your mask, continually, particularly when you're with someone that you don't live with, washing your hands, keeping your distance, all of those measures work effectively for the new strain, which is considered to be even more transmissible. Transmissible. It may spread more easily. However, being able to get tested, get treatment if you are positive and have symptoms, wear your mask, distance and wash your hands can still help prevent uh, you from getting exposed to the new strain. Unfortunately, we don't have enough vaccine right now for every Rhode Islander. No state does for any of, that, those, any of their uh, uh, residents. And treatment is something that is available, and we really encourage everyone to access it, but it is available for those who test positive and have symptoms and have the qualifications. So if you test positive and have symptoms, find out from your healthcare provider if you're 65 years of age and older or you have some underlying illness, get access to the treatment because it is there for you and is an excellent tool to help keep you out of the hospital. But testing is something that is available for every Rhode Islander. It doesn't require you to be a certain age. You don't have to wait for a particular time. It is accessible and we ask, we urge that you take advantage of the testing capacity that we have in the state. It's a way to keep yourself healthy and safe and it's a way to protect your household. Before passing things to Dr. Chan, I want to thank everyone to pause a minute and to really just thank everyone. It's been a very long 10 months. We've all learned a lot. Crisis is a very powerful teacher. One thing that I've seen and learned time and time again is that we do so much better when we come together and support each other. We all want to get vaccinated as quickly as possible. And believe me, we all want to vaccinate everyone as quickly as possible. We all want to be healthy and safe and to keep our loved ones healthy and safe and to get COVID-19 behind us. We are getting there, but it is taking time. And we want to thank everyone for your patience, for your sacrifice, and your focus on working with us to get to this point. We need to keep it going for a little while longer. As Dr. Chan has said, this is the beginning of the end of our pandemic response. And we need to remember that we're all in this together. So please, 
Let's keep supporting each other. As we hear about the vaccine rollout, let's keep making sure that those who are at highest risk of hospitalizations and death stay at the front of the line. With the limited supply that we have, we want to get it to them first. Those who are at much lower risk of actually having to go to the hospital or dying from COVID, even though they may be exposed to it, use the tools that we have, getting tested regularly, wearing your mask, social distancing, knowing that you have the capacity in your hands to stop transmission, and the vaccine can be reserved for those who are at higher risk of going to the hospital or dying if they were to be infected with COVID-19. We can do this, we can support each other, and be selfless in helping to ensure that those most vulnerable get taken care of first in Rhode Island. With that, I'll pass it to Dr. Chan for a vaccine update, and then we'll take some questions. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for those updates, Dr. Alexander Scott. As the director said, we are in a good place with our vaccine campaign. The biggest challenge we face right now is lack of supply. We are not getting a lot of vaccine here in Rhode Island as other states. We are still getting roughly about 14,000 doses a week, which is only enough to vaccinate 1.5% of the population of Rhode Island uh, a week. Something that Dr. Alexander Scott shared last week that I really want to reiterate is that we would absolutely love to vaccinate all Rhode Islanders. That is our goal eventually. Uh, if we had enough vaccine today, we would do it today, uh, but we just don't, but we're getting there. Older adults and healthcare providers are the two groups that we have started to vaccinate. However, even within these two groups, we cannot vaccinate everyone right away. That is why we have to take a stepwise approach. Could we please show the graph with these two population sizes? There are roughly 187,000 people in Rhode Island who are older than 65 years of age. If we were to say that all adults 65 years of age and older were eligible eligible to get vaccinated right now, it would still take us months to get through this population, given that the 14,000 doses uh, we are getting a week is just not enough. And that is even if we did not administer a single dose to other groups like healthcare providers and people that are at other, higher risk. So we are vaccinating older adults in a stepwise approach. We started vaccinating, I, as many people know, in nursing homes in December. This week, we're starting to vaccinate, very uh, thrilled to say, in assisted living facilities and other congregate living settings. And by the middle of next month, we anticipate the vaccine will be available for adults 75 years of age and older. As the director said last week, it would not be honest or fair of us uh, here at the Department of Health and the state uh, to tell all people older than 65 years of age that they can be vaccinated uh, today because we just don't have that amount of vaccine, unfortunately, to support that kind of demand. In other states which have taken this approach, uh, it has resulted in an enormous amount of confusion, frustration, including long lines and crowds, which we're obviously trying to avoid during this pandemic. The other example is healthcare providers. There are roughly 65,000 licensed healthcare providers in the state of Rhode Island. Healthcare providers are critical, my colleagues, critical to our response. We would absolutely love to vaccinate all healthcare providers right away, again, if we had enough vaccine. But with us getting only 14,000 doses a week, it would take us months to get through the healthcare population itself, even if we, again, did not administer a single dose to other populations, uh, including older adults. That is, again, why we are taking a stepwise approach to vaccinating healthcare workers as well. We started with those at higher risk, those in the hospital setting. We then started vaccinating EMS professionals, and now we're working on outpatient healthcare providers, those in primary care, et cetera. We understand that there's a tremendous amount of demand for vaccine, and that's great. We love it. That's what we want to see. Uh, and we are trying to vaccinate as many people as quickly and efficiently as possible. But again, we just don't have uh, enough vaccine to go around. And we're doing it in a stepwise approach, and it's really being driven by science and data uh, as well as guidance from the CDC and others. The aim of our phase one vaccination program has been to ensure the stability of our healthcare system and protecting our long-term care facilities, uh, as well as starting to vaccinate in some of our hardest hit areas. 
Again, vaccinating our healthcare workers is critical given that they care for older folks. And we've seen in areas where the healthcare system has become overwhelmed that there's a mortality that more people die because healthcare system is not able to adequately respond. Moving forward, our vaccination campaign will be focused on protecting Rhode Islanders who are most vulnerable to severe illness with COVID-19. We are asking everyone for their patience just a little bit longer. We promise there will be a vaccine for every person in Rhode Island who wants one in the future. In terms of the data on doses administered over the last week, we have been administering on average roughly 2,500 doses per day total, counting both first and second doses. That's an increase over the previous week when we were administering an average of 2,200 doses a day. Over the last three weeks, our number of total doses administered has increased from just over 10,000 to just over 15,000 to now over 17,000 for this last week. Even though we've only been getting 14,000 doses per week, we are, starting to, we are going to be administering more than 14,000 doses a week because we're starting to administer second doses to some of the first people who were vaccinated. If we could please display the table with who's getting vaccinated this week, I will give you some detail on who we're currently focusing on. Vaccination, uh, vaccinating is continuing to happen in hospitals this week. Many hospital workers are currently getting the second dose of their vaccine. Our regional clinics are still running for a number of populations, including pharmacists, laboratory professionals, college health services, staff uh, at our alternative hospital sites, among other groups. I'm pleased to say that CVS and Walgreens have completed their first round of vaccinating uh, this week at nursing homes and are now starting at assisted living facilities in Rhode Island. Approximately 10,000 doses have been administered to nursing home residents and staff during this first round. The pharmacies are going to go to all these facilities three times to make sure that folks have uh, the ability to re receive their re recommended two doses of the vaccine. The assisted living facilities are part B of the pharmacy's vaccinating plan, and it includes roughly 32,000 people. Many of them are older adults, including assisted living residents and staff, and people who live in elderly housing with residential services. Looking ahead to the week of January 25th, many of these same groups will continue to be vaccinated. The one big change is that outpatient healthcare providers will start to get vaccinated this week. Outpatient healthcare providers include primary care providers, dentists, pediatrician, et cetera, people who are at higher risk of acquiring COVID-19. Outpatient healthcare providers will be getting vaccinated at our regional clinics as well as some of our hospital sites as well. After outpatient healthcare providers get started, we're going to start next with a group of healthcare workers and people in congregate settings. That group includes people who work in dialysis centers, people who are involved in blood, organ, and tissue donations, funeral home workers, and adults in group homes for people with developmental disabilities. Once we get this segment going, we are going to look next to people who are aged 75 years of age and older. Regarding uh, that group, we are exploring a number of sites where vaccine can potentially be available to people older than 75. Those sites could include, still in development, but could include places like pharmacies, regional clinics, or senior centers. The Rhode Island Office of Healthy Aging has been a great partner in thinking how to make this work, uh, so thank you to the staff uh, working as part of that effort. In addition to our plans for adults 75 years and older, we are also finalizing plans for the next phase of our vaccination campaign. We will be presenting those plans to the Rhode Island COVID-19 Vaccine Subcommittee tomorrow morning to get their feedback. We anticipate having uh, those plans finalized by next week, so stay tuned. The last thing I want to address today are a couple of myths uh, that have been circulating about COVID-19 vaccine. There have been people uh, who've been suggesting on social media that COVID-19 vaccine somehow causes infertility. In fact, I was shopping at the grocery store the other day and the cashier, when I was checking out, young lady, uh, we started talking, she had seen me on TV. She mentioned that her main concern about getting COVID vaccine was infertility. So we chatted about that for a while and I want to make, uh, make it clear that there is zero scientific claim uh, basis to this claim. And to be clear, uh, this vaccine uh, does not cause infertility. It does not cause a person to be sterile. There's been several national organizations uh, that have come out by this. This is just categorically false. There's no evidence that COVID-19 vaccine causes increased risk of infertility, uh, first or second trimester loss, stillbirth, congenital anomalies, or other uh, congenital defects. I just wanted to be clear about that. This is one piece of misinformation out there. We're also hearing other things, such as that this vaccine could cause a COVID-19 itself, uh, and that this vaccine can cause or alter your DNA. And those are also categorically false. 
uh, misinformation. We understand that a lot of people have questions, which is great. Again, a lot of interest in, the, in this vaccine, which we are thrilled uh, about. And a lot of people, of course, search online for answers. We just recommend that you please keep in mind uh, to rely on trusted sources of information. Trusted sources include news organizations, uh, which are great and have been established, uh, established medical and public health organizations like the CDC. And of course, the best place to turn to is your primary care provider uh, here in Rhode Island. And of course, uh, here at the Department of Health, uh, we follow evidence and data, especially related to these vaccines. If you want to get the latest from the Department of Health on our COVID-19 vaccination update, as well as frequently asked questions, you can sign up for our weekly email update. Uh, as the director shared, you can do that by going to c19vaccineri.org, uh, c19vaccineri.org. So in closing, I do want to thank everyone again for their patience as we continue to roll out vaccines. We're getting there. Uh, there's certainly more to come. So with that, I think we can open it up for a couple questions. Dr. Alexander Scott, you mentioned getting the vaccine in the hands of those who need it most and make sure they're at the front of the line. Uh, the Attorney General's office said yesterday that they're looking into the vaccine distribution at Lifespan and Care New England and the Department of Health Oversight, apparently concerned about who in the hospital system was getting the vaccine, whether it's board members or people who are not working on the front lines. Uh, how do you assure people that the right people are getting the vaccine and some of maybe there aren't questionable steps being skipped and people are line jumping as there is bound to be concerns about. Yeah, first I'll say from the hospital's standpoint, generally the hospitals have been very good partners throughout this response in helping to ensure not only their staff but others outside of the hospital community uh, are vaccinated. One of the aims of phase one of the vaccination campaign has been to protect our hospital infrastructure so emergency care is available when people need it. For that reason, the hospitals are being allocated vaccine to vaccinate throughout their organizations incrementally. They were told to vaccinate their highest exposure healthcare workers first. Other people throughout hospitals are also getting vaccinated after them because even though they may not be actually patient facing, they are part of what makes a hospital function. So our social workers, laboratory staff, administrators, custodians, IT professionals, dietitians have been included in the um, mix of those within the hospital system uh, to get vaccinated. Um, as the hospitals have moved into vaccinating their non-clinical staff, we have been able to work with them to uh, shift to vaccinate more of the outpatient providers who are clinical staff outside of their systems as well. So there is an ability to be dynamic with this. We leave it up to the hospital to determine that individual that is in, but are working closely with them to ensure that those who are most clinically facing, those who are at highest risk, continue to stay at the forefront of um, who's vaccinated, and they're able to take care of the non-clinical facing ones that also contribute to the hospital functioning. Do you have concern about how, this, how it looks, though, when people who are not dealing with patients are on the front lines are getting the vaccine before people who are 65 or 75 years or older? I definitely understand the optics uh, concern that exists. We do know that those individuals not directly interfacing with patients still do contribute to the hospital functioning well and effectively. Um, and with that, we also know that those who are out in the community continuing to face patients need to get access to the vaccine. And as I shared earlier last week, really because of this partnership with hospitals, we were able to accelerate vaccinating outpatients, providers, through the hospital mechanism because of that. And the hospitals continue to tell us we are eager to do more and to vaccinate outside of their system, knowing that it is a ready-made uh, logistics to, um, a ready-made logistical approach to getting many people vaccinated. So I am comfortable now overall with uh, where that is, given the broad number of people we've been able to get vaccinated quickly through that system. Director, what penalties what penalties, though, do you think the health department should establish for people who jump the line or for hospitals that don't follow 
your guidelines? So it is an interesting balance. We have made clear the message to hospitals, to all of our vaccinating partners, the importance of keeping equity at the forefront, the importance of focusing on those who are at highest risk, and have made clear the ability to um, uh, change course if we need to because of concern that those vaccinating entities are not following our guidance. When we have overall partners who are working with us, we're making sure that the broader number of individuals that need to get vaccinated um, are getting vaccinated. Uh, we don't have a need to you know, uh, penalize, but we continue to keep at the forefront if there's ongoing concern and there are numbers of people that are getting skipped inappropriately uh, in spite of our messaging, we can absolutely make the changes that we need to make to address that. Dr. Chan, a few weeks ago we had a conversation right after it was one of the vaccine briefings on Zoom or Facebook, whatever it was. There were some people who were complaining about Dr. Finale, Care New England CEO, receiving a vaccine. And it was sort of celebrated as, hey, look, I'm, I'm, he, he said he's doing this to set an example, set a tone for the hospital as a whole. Looking back on that now, is that sort of tone setting mechanic something that other organizations should avoid? In other words, prioritizing people who are on the front lines? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I think what we've tried to do during this pandemic is strike a balance. I think, uh, per what I talked about, there's a number of myths circulating. And what best example can one give about getting the vaccine than to get it themselves? So I think uh, Dr. Finale, others uh, in the community have tried to make an example. And I think there's a case to be made for people who are very visible members uh, of the community to get that vaccine to show that they believe in it, to show that it's safe, et cetera. So it's a balance, but of course we need to prioritize the groups that we've talked about. Mr. Smiley. <clears throat> As we all know, Twin River Valley has maintained a monopoly on the management of in-person casino gaming in Rhode Island. As such, they are the hiring agent for employees at state-owned facilities Twin River and Twin River Tiverton. These casinos represent one of the top revenue sources for the state. I've had an opportunity to discuss working conditions at each casino, both in person as well as virtually. I've visited the casinos. A one-hour interview with a current employee can be found on our site at Facebook, the Coalition Radio. To wit, casino chain chips are freely exchanged between casino patrons and employees, ungloved, at will, uncleaned throughout the entire day. Used Kentucky Fried Chicken wipes from a closed KFC, incredibly enough, have been used as sanitary wipes. The availability of drinking water for employees is extremely limited. The days, despite the presence of plexiglass borders, social distancing is at best uneven. The halls of Twin River often resemble a busy shopping mall to this day. Employees allege that little or no information is shared about in-house COVID cases to employees or to the public, that in fact the restaurant opening was delayed due to a non-reported COVID situation. Critically, casino dealers, despite assurance to the contrary, have been informed that they will no longer be eligible for health insurance, even for those who meet their previously question? announced 30-hour week. Yes, there is a point. These dealers are paid a subminimum wage and rely largely on tips. This despite the acquisition mode Twin River is in. Here's the question. At this moment, the state of Rhode Island is asking casino employees to work in unsafe, unsanitary conditions without health care insurance. There's an element of hypocrisy here, as privately owned businesses must adhere to far more rigid rules, including penalties for health insurance. What will the administration do to protect casino workers? Uh, so I'm not aware of Twin River or Bally's, as it's now known, uh, being exempt from any employment regulations and neither are they exempt from any COVID regulations. Uh, if there are um, allegations of violations of COVID safety protocols, then the Department of Business Regulations will inspect. And if employees feel like they're being treated improperly, then they have recourse like any other employees in Rhode Island. Um, having said that, they've been good partners. As far as we know, they have not been a vector of spread, and we appreciate their cooperation and collaboration to operate at a limited capacity in a safe manner uh, that has uh, been allowed to operate and, and actually continue to provide employment opportunities for quite a few Rhode Islanders. What type of measures, how often are they being inspected, say, relative to the level of inspections? Uh, I'd have to get back to you on the frequency of the inspections, but they are not exempt from, nor are they held to a different standard than we hold any other operating businesses along the existing COVID protocols. Can we expect some type of intervention since it is a state-owned facility, a state-owned business? 
this company, Twin River, is acting as a management agent, all right, on behalf of employees there to achieve some level of safety and or, as, you know, as the state promulgated this week, in the absence of health insurance, there will be fines. You can, you can expect them to be held accountable and held to the same standard that every other business is being held to, and that if they're, in fact, not meeting uh, the protocols that are required by the Department of Business Regulation, the Department of Health, then they'll be given an opportunity to correct those violations, just like any other business. But again, I have no uh, knowledge of or evidence that they're, in fact, violating those, those uh, provisions or protocols. Some states, for any of you, some states have... Uh, advance the proposition of trying to go out on the market on their own with the uh, vaccine manufacturers to try to obtain vaccine. The Biden administration has put the kibosh on this. Is Rhode Island among them? I mean, is there anything you can do, the state can do, to get more vaccine here? Yeah, any pot potential opportunities that we've had to obtain additional vaccine, you can you know, know for sure that Rhode Island has explored. Uh, the conversations that we have had have uh, resulted in where we are with having the amount of vaccine supply uh, that we have. We certainly want to work with the administration who is uh, committed to ensuring that all states get access to the additional vaccine that's needed. So we're going to continue um, moving forward in that realm. We hope that there will be. There are additional vaccines that are being manufactured and um, the Biden administration has been working hard uh, to be ready to accelerate what's needed. There's full pressure nationwide for that to happen. We are ready for when that occurs. Someone who participates in a vaccine trial, one of the new Potentials. Are they removed from the list of someone who received one of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines? Um, we would work closely with the individuals if we know about it. There aren't any uh, different exceptions uh, that are done at this point in time, but if we have additional information that allows us to um, proceed in a way that's adjusted to what they did as part of the vaccine trial, appreciating their service for doing that, then we can make those adjustments. But as of now, things would continue forward. I know you said plans are underway for the next phase and they're going to be introduced tomorrow. Can you give some insight onto who will be prioritized in the next phase and when you see it starting? Yeah, so great question. Uh, it's exciting that we're uh, almost done planning for phase two. Um, I'm going to say that we'll hold details for next week. We're going to get some insights from our vaccine subcommittee. We've uh, taken into account the CDC guidelines, which, have, uh, which uh, weigh in on this. So stay tuned. More next week by Monday or Tuesday. You know, the greatest pushback is coming for not starting with 65 and older. I, I, you mentioned the other states are seeing some confusion, but is there a way to kind of start even older and say, all right, we'll start with 85 plus, or we'll start with... 80 plus and, and then work it back that way to at least get more vaccine into more vulnerable people? Yeah, it's a great question. That's actually exactly what we're doing, right? So even in our phase 1B, part of phase one uh, prioritization, we're starting with people age 75 uh, years old and older. So we are prioritizing 65 years of age and older, but we're starting with those 75 given that they really do have the highest risk of dying. Even sooner, I know again, people are still pointing to other states that have, that have started to do that. Yeah, so again, they should be prioritized in phase two. And if you look at what's happened in other states that have done it, I mean, they've opened it up. Some have used lottery systems, first come, first serve. It's created these really unsafe situations, in my opinion, long lines, overcrowding. And that's exactly what we're trying to avoid as part of the pandemic, obviously. How do you account for the uh, decline in the positivity rate? Is it just the passage of the holidays? And, you know, it's, here it's been a few weeks since the Christmas and New Year's holidays. And is that why the rates are falling off? The decline in the positivity rate is uh, as a result of a compilation of all of the tremendous work that we have put into uh, this happening. It's exactly the direction that we've wanted to go. It's a huge credit uh, to Governor Raimondo and her leadership and the entire team that has worked tremendously. You know, we, we talked about the pause and what we hoped to achieve with that. 
We've told you all about expanded testing and how we want to continue to really drive that forward, the importance of treatment. The vaccine is slowly starting to um, be administered in an effective way to address hospitalizations and positivity rate, and people are listening. You're hearing, you're understanding. We are encouraging you to take advantage of the systems that we have built so that we can see this. There were 20,000 people tested yesterday. We want those numbers to continue, and that's how we'll continue to see the positivity rate go in the direction we want. When do you consider and, or anticipate considering easing some of the restrictions that are currently for right now, we want to continue what's needed because we are well positioned to be ready for the um, novel strain of COVID-19, the UK strain as it's been uh, referred to publicly. Uh, it's, ex it's increasingly more transmissible than the current strain that's in place. Uh, and we know it's in our neighboring states, as I said earlier. So where we are now, the systems that we want to continue to advance in terms of our testing, making sure everyone accesses treatment who has it available to them, and as much vaccine as we get, we push out. That positions us for handling the uh, new strain. We also need to prepare for colleges and universities coming back where thousands of additional young adults who are ready to behave responsibly and work in partnership with us. Um, also is another factor. So we want to keep things as they are, get through these uh, next several weeks, and then in the, in the next three weeks we can come back and assess how we have done and what could be next steps where we can leverage the additional testing that we're doing to help us with the restrictions. Where is high school basketball impacting the numbers? So uh, sports in general is something that we have to um, proceed carefully with and with a huge thank you to uh, Director Janet Coit and the entire team and environmental management really just showing how much of a whole of government response we have had. Um, we, have we have a very thoughtful and comprehensive approach in place with our uh, sports response, basketball included. It really hasn't been just one sport over another. We you know, can sporadically see cases across the board. So having the, the mitigation steps in place are key while balancing it with understanding, particularly for our youth. Sports allows for physical activity, emotional wellness, um, getting together in a safe manner uh, in a way that's healthy for our youth. So we want to strike that balance, but make sure that we're doing it safely. I'm not more concerned about basketball than I am about the other sports. The difference between basketball and, say, wrestling, which is not permitted. I mean, both sports, you're making contact with another person for an extended period of time inside a closed facility. I mean, what's the why basketball and not wrestling? It's uh, more so the uh, proportion of that extended time frame with the one individual uh, that um, is occurring time and time again, as opposed to basketball, where it's a little bit uh, faster moving, a little bit more spread out. There are national standards that are in place that help describe what has led to the categorization, and we can certainly uh, share that to explain further. On that, if I may, just for municipalities that have taken basketball hoops out of tennis courts or other public spaces, certainly Newport is one example of that. Would you recommend they reinstall those, those basketball hoops? We'll work with them. Um, we want to uh, have sports be an, an option that's safe, particularly for our youth, given the physical benefits, the emotional wellness. Um, but want to also do it in a way that um, uh, does not present more risk. So we would want to work with those municipalities in uh, taking an approach that's best. Have you spoken to the hospitals at all about the, the negative optics, as you mentioned, about board members getting vaccines? And does the department plan any changes on its rollout uh, based on the concerns of the attorney general? Uh, yes, we have spoken. We uh, do that regularly. And the, the changes are what I described earlier. It's being able to make the adjustments, which we uh, were doing regardless. 
as you are getting to more low risk individuals who are helping the hospital function but aren't having the same uh, patient uh, interaction as some of our outpatient providers, primary care, dentists, behavioral health care providers, um, the hospitals have been ready to pause on what they are doing to be able to help start earlier the outpatient provider uh, vaccination. And that's key, the ability to be dynamic, to make the adjustment that's needed, and to continue to push forward until all those who are at highest risk get vaccinated. To follow up on that, if I might. So when the Attorney General comes to you as a source of uh, expertise when it comes to who in the hospital can and shouldn't get, you're going to say everything's fine, that it's all good, they're, they're all good to get a, a shot? We're going to be happy to provide any information that the Attorney General uh, would like, and it will include the um, specific guidance that we have said of focusing on those who are at highest risk, um, making sure that we keep a lens of equity in place as we're doing that as well as taking advantage of the hospital's ability to vaccinate large numbers of people uh, quickly in a way that's most effective. Thank you. Doctor, in regards to some uh, cities and towns, Cranston and Providence are considering resolutions asking the state to lift curfew on businesses. We're seeing in North Providence a business refusing to close down. Any plans to do so? What's your message there? Similar to what I answered previously, we are at a, a, a solid place right now. We wouldn't want to make changes too early that would put all businesses at risk, particularly with the new strain in place, particularly with thousands of young adults returning to our state. We want to really ensure that we're going in the right direction um, and it's consistent. And when we come back in about the next uh, three weeks or so, we'll be able to really make that assessment of how we can balance restrictions with the expanded testing and improved systems that we're continually working on to move forward. Do, do, do you expect another surge? The numbers are going down, the hospitalizations are going down. Do you expect with, if the new strain does show up, and as you said, college students coming back, that those numbers are just going to shoot back up again? It's absolutely possible. You know, with this pandemic, we have seen anything is possible. Uh, we are confident in the systems that we have in place. We've worked extremely hard. I had an excellent call with all of the institutes of higher ed presidents uh, just before this uh, press conference. Um, we know what is needed and um, have the operations and systems in place to respond. And then we just have to see how it plays out hope that we can continue to achieve our goal of keeping people out of the hospital, protecting our health care capacity system, uh, preventing deaths, and encouraging everyone to do what you need to do to protect your household. Those strategies are working, and we hope that it will help us withstand what is left to come through the remainder of this pandemic.